so today we have a great pleasure uh, to welcome Tobias Schatz from Freiburg uh, University uh, in Germany. Tobias studied in Munich uh, already during PhD, I think started working with trapped ions and then uh, became master of trapped ions after postdoc with David uh, Weiland, a Nobel Prize winner for, for developing this kind of technologies and then started his uh, research group uh, in Freiburg. Uh, he has lots of very important groundbreaking contributions for quantum simulations with trapped ions and recently realizing his, um, I mean, and later, later he, he is the person who introduced optical trapping uh, for, for, for trapping ions on their own. And very recently realizing ERC consolidator grant, he uh, entered the field of mixed systems of trapped ions and atoms. And I think today we will learn lots of about uh, recent development. So uh, welcome and the stage is yours. So uh, the audience, uh, Mikael and organizers, thank you very much for having me. I had the pleasure and honor to be in Warsaw in person some years ago to give a seminar too. And uh, I hope that not so many things change despite the fact that we are online now and that the audience is as vivid as in former days. And please interrupt me if things get blurred or unclear. What I want uh, to convey to you, and this is part of the kind introduction of Mikhail already, is about trapped ions, trapping ions and atoms at the same time in optical traps. Indeed, I worked with ions in former days, as Mikhail uh, uh, emphasized, but I came out of nuclear physics originally from storage rings. And um, this is why I'm partially connected also to Feshbach resonances that we are finally uh, uh, trying to elaborate on in the ion atom system now. Before I get, well, there's a little bit of a bulky title, let's skip that one and uh, just give you a brief insight into other research topics that we are working on in Freiburg, just to put our work on the optical trapping in context. This is what you see with the first arrow here up uh, on the upper part. And there's an, let's say, equally sized contribution of the group to, uh, on the one hand side, scaling quantum simulations in two dimensions, what is kind of an endeavor with trapped ions in radio frequency traps. One way to address this is not immediately um, uh, connected to optical traps, but we try to uh, uh, control each individual ion in an individual RF trap on a surface trap. So what you see here is the an RF electrode and a lot of DC electrodes, the ions hovering 40 micrometers above the surface, and each ion individually controlled and coupled to its neighbors. This is a very basic triangle now. We are trying to get this larger. And this is a lot of uh, work, sweat, and tears connected to this. Another endeavor is working with one-dimensional crystals, what is much easier and what is done in, in several groups. And there we are working on thermalization effects in closed quantum systems, non-Markovianity uh, uh, effects or squeezing and pair creation processes in motional states. We are very tight and uh, at benefiting a lot from theory contributions in the part of the optical trapping. These are mainly the groups of Robert Moczynski, Mikhail Tomsa and uh, Krzysztof Maczymski, <laughs> please accept my bad German accent, Olivier Dulieu, goes easier for me, at least in pronunciation. But these are the major groups we are currently uh, collaborating with or triggered ideas originally. OK. With that, I would uh, take the step to the outline of the talk. And there, I want to get you motivated in first place. Well, I'm motivated anyways, but I want to convey to you why we are eager to trap ions and atoms optically. I hope after getting you motivated, you, wet, you might get with me through this uh, kind of a little bit uh, exhausting part where I want to explain to you, because you're an atomic physicist, at least most of you, but on a basic level, because I think you have also different background being master students or professors. So I would try to get you through the basics of radio frequency trapping versus, versus optically trapping, and also combining the two to hybrid traps, where the ions are trapped by radio frequency fields and the atoms are trapped by optical fields. Then getting you into our experiments, our experimental protocols, 
And they're not forgetting, and please, if I do so, then remind me, if we talk about combining all the beauties of two fields, we have to be very careful that we are not only combining the challenges or the disadvantages, but we really want to, com to, to, to combine advantages. And this is perhaps the major challenge if you want to do new steps. I want to give you a brief overview over the status, what can be reached currently with ions or with perhaps even Coulomb crystals in optical dipole traps, ODTs. Uh, the optical lattice part I will only uh, mention here uh, because we are mainly right now interested in controlling individual ions or single ions. With that, I would uh, try to do the step towards our recent results on sympathetic, sympathetic cooling in an all optical trap here in the system of barium plus and rubidium, and also going towards the controlling of ion atom interaction in the barium plus lithium system, where we are mainly still in the hyper trap. And of course, I can't hinder myself from giving you an outlook what this might be good for in the far future, going towards ultra cold chemistry, many body physics, and quantum phase transitions. Also, if I look at the clock, that might be quite brief at the end. Okay, it might be advantageous to take a uh, short step into history and ask uh, when, why is there such a difference in trapping ions in IF fields and atoms in optical fields. If you look, for example, for the time scales, it's more than 60 years now of ions in RF and it's only 30 years of atoms in optical lattices. And that gets easily explained by the fact that RF traps are quite steep and deep. So that is of the order of an E volt, that is of the order of 10 to the four Kelvin that particles can have to be still enclosed. While in optical lattices or in optical traps, we have trap depths that are typically of the order of millikelvin. So that is seven orders of magnitude different in, in, in energy scale. And this explains, for example, why for at least loading atoms into optical lattices, laser cooling had to be invented because you can only trap particles uh, that are sufficiently cold already in the beginning. If we think about combining the advantages now, we talked already about the deep wells for the RF traps, but mainly about the controllability of the, of the ions, thinking about quantum information processing, single qubit, two qubit gates, atomic clocks. So they are somehow a gold standard, but it's hard to scale them and uh, the system. And it's uh, also a real pity because we have with the ions, the beautiful long range interaction at hand that makes systems easily larger uh, or better connected, but uh, there are some missing parts. One thing is, for example, the versatile geometries we look jealously at if we think about optical lattices. And they have other additional nice features that one wants to have as an ion trapper. It's state dependent wells. So the confinement being dependent on the electronic state. We might come to this a little bit later, but we are still in the motivation part. On the larger uh, schedule, one might have the idea of having ions in optical lattices where you can then simulate, quantum simulate, spin-spin um, interaction, for example, spin frustration in triangular lattices. For uh, perhaps a little bit easier to be realized would be still an optical lattice filled with neutral atoms and just one atom replaced by an ion. And then if the system is allowed to evolve coherently, the charge might tunnel and then we are not allowed to talk about ions and atoms anymore, but it's just a distributed, currently distributed charge in 2D, what is also, at least from an experimental point of view, interesting. And there are also theoreticians who think this is interesting. One always has to be careful that one doesn't think that only because one can address this problem that theorists will think that this is a new solution. As experimentalists, I want to learn more about these complex, more and more complex quantum systems in real nature with some relationship to, uh, to solid state physics. The work we are currently mainly focusing on is embedding an ion or more than one ion into ultra cold atoms. And that might be Bose-Einstein condensates for bosons or degenerate Fermi gases. But what we want to investigate is the interaction and how to control the interaction of the ion and the atoms in this, uh, in this common ensemble. Okay, so this is the point where you should realize that you are motivated now. So I hope I could get you there because now we would go for some uh, uh, physics background. First of all, basics on radio frequency versus optical trapping. If you ask yourself, what is the difference? There can't be that many differences because it's electromagnetic fields that trap particles. 
particles that carry charge. Once it's ions where the charge is obvious related to the whole atomic ion. And if not, well, you can still polarize the atoms here on the right hand side, an atomic core and an electron. If you consider the left hand side again, the radio frequency trap, then you might ask yourself how to confine a particle in first place. And I just sketched here uh, two electrodes being at ground and two electrodes being connected to an RF frequency. So they change polarity. They're getting, uh, getting from plus to minus. So getting focusing and defocusing uh, effects on the ion. So focusing and defocusing sounds already like doing nothing on average. This is not true. That's the same in storage rings. And uh, you're focusing and defocusing. On average, you're focusing. But you only uh, benefit from a time average potential. And this is now very important because if you look here at our atomic ion and we shine in this RF frequency from here at the trap and the ion sitting down in the center of the trap, you get a time average potential. And the ion is allowed to oscillate with this omega x or y in this time average potential brought up by the RF. What is uh, kind of obvious is if we have to time average the RF field to get the uh, pseudo potential, that the frequency of the RF has to be larger than the frequency of the ion in the, in the, in the pot trapping potential. So our omega RF will be detuned to the blue of the resonance frequency of the ion. And what this brings is, and this might become more obvious when we then look to the optical traps, that we have a low field seeker here where the ion wants to sit in the center between the electrodes. And it's not hunting for highest fields, but for lowest fields. This is why we, even for zeros, this is why we call it a low field seeker. Taking the direct comparison to optical trapping, you might see the laser being shined in now with omega laser, but at much higher frequency. The frequency here is of the order of megahertz. This is 10 to the 14 or even 10 to the 15 hertz. If we shine this in, there is only one particle capable of following this high frequencies. This is the electron. And the, well, this is just in a nutshell in a model. So sorry if it's not going into Hamiltonians and diagonalizing it. It's get to getting the rough picture. Sorry, Mikael, for doing this to you and your colleagues. But shining in the laser now uh, gives us already the impression that you can be to detuned to the red or the detuned to the blue of this uh, uh, interaction or of this trapped electron trapped to the atomic core or vice versa. And if we now look for the laser being blue detuned or being red detuned to this resonance frequency of the electron, we will see that once again, we get blue detuned uh, weak field, low field seeker. So the uh, particle getting repelled from the maximum of intensity of the laser. This would be the Gaussian profile of the laser doing an AC star shift, for example, on the electronic level. So we would get uh, repulsion. But if the laser is detuned to the red of the transition, well, then we get attraction towards the trap center. Now, for the optical trapping, I already mentioned that there is this AC star shift. And just in a nutshell, because we will need it later, I look at it here in a two-level picture, ground state, excited state. If we have an energy difference of h bar omega naught, then we can shine in our laser here at laser frequency omega L detuned to the red by capital delta detuning. Just being the AC star shift, being largest where the intensity of the laser is largest and where the intensity of the laser is zero, no star shift anymore. Comparable to Seaman shifts for the, uh, just for AC electric fields. What one can do in principle, the easiest setup is to focus a laser beam where we, if it's a Gaussian laser beam, red detuned, get maximum intensity in the focus and therefore a potential minimum where the trap depth scales with the intensity divided by the detuning and the off-resonance scattering, so the residual scattering I get here, disturbance, is scaling with 1 over the detuning squared. What kind of explains in a nutshell that if you can afford having twice the laser intensity, you can get to twice of the detuning, still getting the same trap depth, but reducing the off-resonance scattering by a factor of 2. One of the main reasons why people tend to go to larger and larger detunings, as we, do also, as we also do. Of course, there's a lot of beauty to play around with. This is very easy Gaussian uh, profile, a simple Gaussian profile. We can go for crossed uh, beams. We can go for interfering beams. So then we have the lattices. Or we can think about Bessel beams where we have no Rayleigh range at first order and where we get extended cylinders of light, for example, giving us these, these versatile trapping geometries that we would be eager to exploit. 
now the idea and that was pioneered uh, by several other groups uh, was originally to overlap atoms and ions in a hybrid trap. So getting, and you see this sketched on the left-hand side, getting the overlap of an RF trap where the blue ion is trapped in with an optical trap where the atoms are trapped in. And I sh should emphasize here that there's beautiful work and impressive results achieved within this hybrid traps in the group of perhaps most recently in the group of Amsterdam Ulm and at the Weizmann Institute. And I will sometimes refer to this work during this talk. Here, I want to get to one of the handicaps why we want to go for pure optical trapping, also of the ion. If you look here for the radial amplitude of motion independence of time, then you see something like an overall sinusoidal a, a cosine, uh, okay, starting here, a sinusoidal motion that is this secular motion of the ion in the pseudopotential. But as soon as the ion gets displaced from the trap center where the RF amplitude is zero, you get these additional wiggles. And this is due to the fact that you get closer to one of these RF electrodes and you get driven motion. Driven motion by the RF frequency faster than the secular motion, but giving us these ripples. So the handicap was very well described by the group of Ladan Vulicic in a classical picture. I want to show to you first the experimental result. If you start, here is the temperature of an ion, and here's the number of collisions with ultra-cold atoms. What does this mean? Where well, the atoms are held at a temperature of the order of five microkelvin, and the ion starts at a temperature of roughly a millikelvin or 500 microkelvin. So in principle, you would think if I embed now an ion into this much colder, two orders of magnitude colder bath, I should get a cooling of the ion. What you experimentally observe is that the temperature increases with the number of collisions. So there must be, and these are results from the group of Roy Seri from the Weizmann Institute, there must be additional effects. And this can be described in a classical picture where you have the ions and the atoms still represented like dots or billiard balls. But if the ion approaches, uh, the atom approaches the ion sitting at the RF knot, then there will be an interaction between atom and ion. They will, will be displaced. The ion will be displaced from the trap center. And then dependent on the phase of the oscillation, energy is pumped into the system and giving at early stage or later stage, a lot of energy into the system. This is due to the one over R to the four potential that we have between atom and ion. The ion is polarizing the atom. Coulomb interaction of the ion directly, one over R. Polarizing dipole, dip, a dipole interaction, one over R to the third, giving us this one over R to the four potential. And displacing the ion from the trap center allows to pump heat into the system. Well, oh, sorry, I should have mentioned here in addition that if you get um, heavier ions and lighter atoms, that you can somehow reduce, ease this issue because the ion then gets less displaced from the RF node. And this can be, for example, reached if you use heavy ions like a terbium plus or barium plus, uh, mass 138, uh, compared to lithium uh, six, for example, with much smaller mass, giving in the, uh, um, in the center of mass frame, uh, higher uh, collisional energies or smaller collisional energies for comparable temperatures. But this at a later stage, this is why using lithium being very light and this very heavy ion is also advantageous in hybrid traps, as also emphasized, uh, to be emphasized by the group of uh, uh, René Geritzmeier in Amsterdam, who reached uh, close to the S-wave uh, um, regime in a hybrid trap. Okay, so how are we running our experiments? We are still preparing and detecting our ions in an RF trap. Why? Well, we have to load the particles first out of ovens, for example, and then to Doppler cool them and to compensate for stray electric fields. This is all done in RF in an RF trap. Then in a the second step, we switch on the dipole trap. So here indicated by this bar, we switch off the pole trap, we can keep the DC on uh, for keeping some confinement by DC fields. And then we store the ion for a certain amount of time, T opt within this optical dipole tra trap and can do experiments with the ion there. For example, also overlapping it uh, with an atomic ensemble sitting there, but now in the absence of these RF fields. And then we switch on the pole trap again, switch off the optical trap and do our detection currently still in the RF trap. Okay. 
there are some challenges in doing that. I want to don't want to elaborate uh, lengthily on this, but you have, of course, to have sufficient stray field compensation. If not, just the stray fields push you out of these shallow optical potentials. And you have to be careful if you do the transition from the RF trap to the optical trap. On the one hand side, being fast enough not to get heating and uh, hitting resonances that might be between the two traps or in the, of the individual traps. But at the same time, you want to combine the two minima that don't overlap in the first place sufficiently uh, uh, slowly that you get an overlap of the position of the ion in the uh, original trap and in the final trap, not to heat up just by switching one trap off and having the other on and then having, of course, a lot of additional kinetic energy in there. If you do all of this correctly, we can get to the status of the ions in optical dipole traps. And there, once again, the very brief historic view in 2010, we reported about trapping a single ion in an optical dipole trap and in an optical lattice uh, briefly later. And there's also work at, in the group of Vlad and Bulletic at MRT and Michael Drusen in ours and also others meanwhile, where they have optical lattices, but still store, give the radial confinement by RF fields. So we are focusing on the work where we give all of the confinement by fields, either DC fields or optical fields, no RF being on because of the issues discussed. After this 280 nanometers UV traps, we went to further detuning and there we saw that we could reduce the scattering rate by three orders of magnitude, uh, reduce the heating rate by four orders of magnitude, and uh, mainly due to the fact that we were also capable of getting this stray field compensation to a, a very low value. So the residual stray fields at that time were smaller than seven millivolts per meter measured with the ion in the RF trap. Still, we got trapping durations of milliseconds only. And of course, we want to have longer interaction durations. And so we went for further detuning, but still not forgetting that we also need uh, at a later stage, this visible tra traps at 532 nanometers being always indicated as green now. The 1064 nanometers are indicated as red. Please don't look at all of these details here. The main important uh, issue here is here that you can look at the optical trapping probability independence of the trapping duration. And as a really poor man's fit, because we can't claim to understand all the individual dynamics in, 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 at one spot. But if you take a very coarse fit by an exponential, you end up with something like three seconds lifetimes in this uh, infrared trap. And interesting for us was that this is pretty much the lifetime of neutral atoms under similar conditions. Why I'm adding here similar conditions? Well, because uh, we need in the beginning uh, large laser power because we start with the ion at Doppler cooling temperature. And that means we need something like at least 10 times a trap depth by the optical fields to confine these. And this means we need quite some laser power and small beam wastes. And this is, of course, some handicap. Still, we get, and here's a, a simplified picture of the electronic level scheme of barium plus. You see here the S ground states, the excited P levels separated by the spin orbit coupling, and here the D states also separated by spin orbit, coup spin orbit coupling. And here the 1064 nanometers providing us with uh, confinement for the S to P transition, but also with confinement from the D to P transition. Still, because the uh, confinement is depending on the coupling between the two states, the coupling will be different between S to P and D to P, giving us these state dependent trapping the potentials. The clickable content could be found on the screen. Oh, what can't be found? Sorry. There was a question. Did I get it correctly? No, no, I think it was some background noise. Ah, it was background. Okay. Yeah, background is also an issue that I didn't cover so far, but uh, yeah, uh, don't get in. I won't get in too much details. I want just to emphasize that this is something very uncommon for RF trappers that the uh, confinement gets strongly state dependent. Okay, with that, I want to get you towards the experimental results and start here with a sympathetic cooling in a purely optical trap. And for this purpose, I will introduce you to the need of a bichromatic trap. So we need two colors at the same time for the barium plus rubidium system. Okay, just as a recap, short reminder, we have red detuning for getting AC starship for confinement in the ground state. But if you look now at the 
more complex system, so it's not two level, but for example, three levels, like in Barium, we have the S state, the D state, and the P state, then you see already you might be ready tuned from the S to P transition, but you are already blue detuned here from the D to P transition, so you get defocusing in the D level. And now this just hints at the fact that we have to be now careful, not only on the electronic state that we have, but also on the species. We want to confine barium ions and rubidium atoms at the same time. And so we have to think about how to do this. If you want to fall asleep for three minutes during my talk, do it now, I will wake you up again. The, here's some details about the need of uh, bichromatic traps if you want to have sufficient control, at least in the current setup. You see here the barium ion, once again, the individual electronic states, and compared to that, the rubidium atom. If we shine in now our red detuned laser, then you see that we are red detuned from both levels here. So both levels will see attraction, just state dependent. And for rubidium, we also, uh, for everything that is of concern, we are red detuned, so we get confinement. If we shine in our visible laser, and this is now the same, this is not to scale here. This is just pedagogically not well done. This is the same laser, okay? But you see here, the transition wavelength is 593 nanometers for this transition. And here it is uh, 780 for this transition. So a laser at 532 nanometers is detuned to the red of these transitions, but is detuned to the blue of these transitions. Okay, this gives us some playground, but also one of the main reasons why we can't start, and here's shown how we do it experimentally, we overlap these two beams on the barium ion and the rubidium ensemble. And if we shine it in, then we get uh, trapping for the barium in the S state for the visible and the near infrared laser, and for the atom for the near infrared laser only. Still, you could say then use the near infrared laser and get a monochromatic trap. But there's two additional things to be considered. Ions, and this is not only the barium plus, but this is true in general, ions are further than tuned from the near infrared laser because there is already an electron missing. You need for in ions in general more energy to get excitation. That is your laser will always be, so to say the wavelength uh, will, or the, the energy of the laser will always be less close to this uh, excited state. And therefore the, the tuning is larger for the ions and therefore the confinement is weaker. And as emphasized before, if you want to start with a pretty hot iron, well, you need deep trapping potentials and you are not allowed to do, for example, evaporative cooling of your atoms because if you lower now the trapping potential to evaporatively get the hotter uh, atoms away and to re-thermalize, you would lose the iron first. So to give every species their needs, we need a bichromatic trap where the green light and the red light are both attractive for the barium and attractive for the rubidium for the near infrared, but repulsive for the visible light. Okay, you survived the two minutes. You can stay for one minute off. Here's a basic example what I'm talking about. If we take the red laser at a certain laser power and waste and the green laser is a certain laser power and waste, we can look at our species, what is happening with the AC star shift. We see here for the barium ion that we get an optical trapping potential and for the rubidium atoms that we get some contribution that is confining and some contribution that is deconfining and this comes in from the visible lights so we see this mexican hetero this donut donut structure that reduces the density of the rubidium at the position of the barium ion if we then increase and this is done here the uh, focusing power of the infrared laser, then we can bring the rubidium atoms in overlap with the barium ion. So that gives us the individual control of the trapping potentials for the ions being sufficiently steep also because of the stray fields and for the atoms to still allow for evaporative cooling and all the preparation steps needed for this ensemble. And now I would ask you to wake up again because this is what we are really doing. You see here to the left, once again, the near infrared and the Visible light, both being, giving focusing effects. These are added up to the blue curve here. So this is the overall optical potential. But now we have to consider the effect of stray fields. And if you imagine that you have a trapping potential and you apply a force by stray fields, for example, you get your potential landscape tilted. And this is what you see here. So the overall trapping potential gets reduced by these stray fields and other 
influences of DC fields. So what we only are allowed to consider is the effective trap depth that we get here for the barium ion. On the other hand side, the rubidium atom doesn't feel uh, to first order electric fields, of course. So here we see the focusing effect of the near infrared laser, the defocusing effect of the visible laser. And if we add it up correctly, then we get these very shallow traps like we would like to have it for the atoms. So with that, getting into the regime where we can overlap the two species, have individual control and initialize them in the regimes where we want them to be. Okay, and this brings me to the results of the uh, sympathetic cooling. Don't get into the details of the protocol. I sketch it in a much simpler fashion here. What this protocol is good for here in a more elaborate way is to hint you that all these lasers and near infrared power visible ray have to go to the right ramps to allow for the transfer, pre-cooling overlap. The green phase here that is indicated is the moment uh, where we can talk about these two potentials that I just showed you for the rubidium, the black curve, and for the barium plus the black curve too. And here perhaps an additional remark, as soon as the energy of the part, the kinetic energy of the particles is larger than this optical effective trap depth, we will lose them, right? So they will just be able to escape. This gives us the possibility to do a temperature measurement. If we use this Boltzmann distribution, so the population of the energy levels, independence of the energy, and we choose a certain trap depth, then we cut off the high energy tail. That would be just the energies above here. And by that, we can do a temperature scan over our evolution. So now please forget this protocol to the left and look to the right. So what we are really doing is, in the beginning, we load an eye in here. We displace it by electric fields. Why? Because then we have to build up over a second or even longer in a magneto-optical trap and transfer it in an optical dipole trap, the rubidium ensemble. We then do the cooling here. We get the ion shifted back just close to the ensemble where we Doppler pre-cool it again and then bring it in overlap, all still with the RF trap being on. Amount of atoms roughly 500 the Doppler temperature for the ions being roughly 300 to 400 microkelvin and the rubidium being currently here at 30 microkelvin. And then within this bichromatic trap, we switch the RF off. So what can we now observe? We observe that the trapping probability in dependence on the trap depth, so this is this U0 I was referring to, this U0, if we have sufficiently high U0, we will always trap optically, but if we reduce now the optical trap depth, we will reduce also the trapping probability. If we do this without the interaction of the rubidium before, so running the same protocol, but just not having the rubidium present, we see a curve where the trapping probability is systematically lower than for the blue curve where the rubidium was present, had an overlap. And we derive from that, that we get sympathetic cooling here by 100 microkelvin due to the fact that we have the rubidium atoms overlapping. We would be almost close to celebrate this, but we have to keep in mind that we are here not in the ultra cold regime so far, and that there must be a reason why we are not further cooling, right? So talking frankly about the handicaps we have here still is, once again, we still need also in the bichromatic trap, a lot of laser power. So there are a lot of photons present and we get photo assisted losses just in this humongous, beautiful landscapes of, uh, of interaction potentials, there are additional possibilities to, for example, to, uh, to, to excite and lose the ions or atoms. In addition, because also because we have to have these deep trapping potentials in the beginning, we have very small beam waves, and that means in the bichromatic trap, if they shift against each other, that gives us not only additional heating, but also density fluctuations of the atoms. Just think about this Mexican head again. If you dare shake the center, you will shake the density of the, de uh, of the, 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 the density dist distribution too at the position of the ion. And this gives us density fluctuations. And in the atom ion systems, these three body losses that are related to these density fluctuations set in much earlier. So even so we have a density that is pretty low here, only five times 10 to the 11 cubic centimeters. If it goes up by one order of magnitude or a little bit more, we get dominated by the, by the impact of the three body losses. And this is coming in now already for longer trapping durations due to this modulation. And this is why we get on average only one Langevin collision, only one 
collision that allows for cooling in this rubidium ensemble. That gives us already this drop in energy, which is quite nice. But we have to get colder in first place. We have to be allowed to start with colder uh, barium ions in the in the hybrid trap, in the pole trap, to uh, to allow for lower light intensity to mitigate all of these problems to get to even lower temperature. And this is, I think, where the next uh, where the transition to the next uh, topic occurs quite naturally. We have <clears throat> to better control the ion atom interaction out of an experimental point of view to get better prepared. But of course, out of a scientific reason, because controlling the atom ion interaction is a whole beauty by itself. And for that purpose, we choose here the barium plus lithium system, beginning still in the hyper trap and the lithium out of the reason uh, mentioned before that with its lower mass, we have the advantages still in the hyper trap too. Low mass, less displacement of the barium ion being heavy. You remember this, less driving of the RF, still being a fundamental limit, but less of impact. And here I should emphasize that it's not me doing all of this work. This is the happy group. And you can see how happy atom ion trappers are. The most prominent people right now are Fabian Thielemann here, Pascal Weckesser finishing his PhD and then starting a, a postdoc at Emanuel Bloch's group at MPQ. And Tom Walker, whom I still don't have a picture of, uh, uh, joining us from Great Pigeon as an assistant in this team. And the other ones also happy contributing as master or bachelor students. Okay, so before I can just jump with you into this atom ion interaction, I once again, in a nutshell, uh, want to explain to you which interaction we want to use here. And I already asked Mika not to intervene if something is too simply minded in the explanation. It's just to give a rough overview and some of the reasons why atomic physicists sometimes are scared from molecular science. What you see here is the molecular potential energy curves of barium and lithium. So you see here the energy scale and here the mutual distance between the particles. And you can see here, for example, a barium plus ion and a lithium atom coming in in the ground state. And here is the molecular potential. And you see all of a sudden, well, here are two curves, not only one. Well, this originates from the mutual spin orientation of the two particles. If the two spins are aligned, we get a triplet. If the two spins are uh, anti-parallel, we get uh, a singlet. And this gives us already two um, molecular potential energy curves here. So if the two particles approach each other from infinity, they see at least these two uh, pathways, these two potentials. But looking a little bit more in detail in the, to the Hamiltonian, you see here a kinetic part. You see here an angular momentum part. Here you see the uh, molecular potentials that are indicated here. It's black and red. So this is this part. You get spin-spin interaction, spin-orbit interaction, and the individual contributions of the Hamiltonian of the atom, the internal decrease of heat and of the atoms. But what we have to have additionally in mind is this angular momentum contribution. And well, this can be combined with the uh, molecular potential. And then you see for S equals zero, there's no angular momentum, L equals zero. So you just get the original curve VR. But if you add angular momentum, of course, you get the contributions of P L equal one, D L equal two. And since this is a, a different sign in, the, uh, in this effective potential, we get this uh, energy barriers built up here. And this will be important in terms of energy scales we will discuss. But in principle, you would have to fill in all of these additional potential curves in here too. And then you could find all the vibrational levels in these, uh, in these uh, potentials. And then you would have a more complete picture. We want, don't want to do this right now. We ask ourselves what happens if the energy of the incoming particles, the collisional energy, is perhaps tuned close or on resonance with one of these bound states in the, uh, in the molecular potential. And this is well known from nuclear physics in former times, and it was used as a workhorse in neutral atoms as a Feshbach resonance. Now we want to do this not with atom-atom interaction, but atom-ion interaction, and there are differences. And I want to highlight these differences. So if you look at the two potentials, once you have a one over R to the six potential, Dipole-dipole fluctuating, dipole-dipole fluctuating, one over R to the third, one over R to the third, giving you a one over R to the six potential. For the ion atom interaction, you get an one over R to the four, as mentioned before, one over R for the Coulomb potential, one over R to the third for the dipole 
polarization, so one over R to the four in total. If you look now what about the changes between the two potentials, well, you get different asymptotes. You get quite steep uh, uh, potential wells here, and you get larger extended potential wells for the atom ion interaction. That means also that the density of the vibration at states go up here, right? So density gets just increased. Perhaps even more important, if you look at typical scattering length and typical energy scales, we should look at this uh, graph again to derive the typical scattering length and the typical energy scales. And here it's worth looking into this inset where you see the difference out here between the S L equals zero and the P L equal one uh, potentials. Because you see here this R star being of course much further out than the, in the atomic picture, much further out. And the energy scale here is related to the uh, potential barrier of the L equal one, so the P um, uh, partial wave. So this is the energy scale and this is the scattering length scale. The scattering length scale is at least an order of magnitude larger for atom ion interaction. And if you ask of further scaling, well, then if the R star gets an order of magnitude larger, the energy scale being proportional to one over R star squared gets at least two orders of magnitude smaller for the atom ions ensemble. So the interaction being much more long range, but also the energy, the collisional energy, and therefore the temperature in the system much be, must be much smaller than in the atom-atom system. And that made it so far elusive to really get into the regime where only a few partial waves or one partial wave can contribute in the atom ion system. Okay. So our way to approach this here, starting in still the hypertrap, so IF trap and X ODT cross optical dipole trap for the atoms and the uh, dipole trap for the uh, an optional dipole trap for the ions, we superimpose spin polarized lithium atoms, lithium six atoms with after a few collisions, spin polarized barium ions. And our experimental parameters are of the order of 20,000 lithium six atoms in spin state two. So this is not the, out, the absolute ground state out of some reasons uh, that I might refer to later. We have a temperature of the lithium atoms of the order of a microkelvin and an atomic peak density of the order of 10 to the 12 per cubic centimeter. We observe that we need something like 100 collisions for thermalization, quite a few, quite a few but that's how it is. And we reach final temperatures uh, of the barium ion of 100 microkelvin, referring to in the uh, center of mass frame to a collisional energy of the barium. So the lithium much lighter moves fast, much faster. So the kinetic energy in this uh, center of mass frame gets reduced to 15 uh, microkelvin roughly. We can try to now do the experimental gymnastics that theory foresees to finding these resonances. So what would these in the, what would these lead to? Well, we might think about tuning with a magnetic field, the uh, using that there is a differential magnetic moment between the molecular states and the uh, 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 particles not interacting. We could have, for example, three body collisions where uh, two atoms and an ion combine to a molecular ion and uh, atom being expelled, both at higher energies. But if these molecules break up, this leads to three body losses of the ions. But of course, we would also hope to be capable to control the elastic collisions that provide us with cooling to see and emphasize sympathetic cooling of the system, depending now on the magnetic field that we are shining in. So first of all, the easiest way is to make things kaput. Uh, like uh, uh, Ketterle said in one of his talks. So we are searching, searching for the losses that are interesting by themselves, but of course, in first place, losses. And here, well, if we now tune the magnetic field, having prepared everything the way I was uh, uh, explaining, then we see here the ion survival in the trap, in dependence of the magnetic field, having these dips. So we lose the ions independence, independent on not independence, on an independence on the magnetic field. So magnetic field dependent loss features, they are predictions by theory where, not exactly where these loss features should be lying, but about mutual differences, uh, 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 mutual distances in magnetic field detuning. And 
we found these resonances in this state, let's say, all over the place. Well, before getting into more, you know, or perhaps about discussing what has to be done next in collaboration theory and experiment, I want just to jump from an experimental point of view to let's investigate the dynamics at these features or around these features in our setup. So let's sit at the magnetic field here, for example, and asking ourselves what happens during this interaction or what are the parameters we can tune in addition. Well, if we have iron loss here, then the iron loss depends for sure on the atomic density. If the density is zero, no loss. If the density goes up, well, how do the losses increase with the density? And what you see here is the iron loss rate in dependence on the atomic density. So if we had two body losses, then we should increase the losses just linearly with the atomic density. What we see here is, and this is giving you the experimental data here with aero bars, that can get fitted by a curve that is proportional to n squared, meaning that these are well, the strong evidence that we have three body losses here, where two lithium atoms and an ion, barium ion, combine to barium lithium and an expelled lithium atom. Just for comparison and for the eye, this would be the curve being linear and loss for, for two body losses. We can derive uh, reaction rates out of this. I think the important point is here to mention that, and uh, I put this in quotation marks out of good reasons, because in first place, one might think that the lithium atoms due to the Pauli principle, so they are fermions and uh, spin polarized, won't interact anymore are too far away from each other. So that might strongly suppress this three body recombinations because the lithium atoms can't come close to each other anymore. But it's a more complex problem. And it's very interesting to discuss this with our theory friends where many body physics turns in getting the interaction going and giving us the right or the scientific reasoning for having these three body losses here. So now we made things kaput. It's not only kaput because this can be also used to learn more about the interaction potential between ions and atoms. And this will be very interesting to be looked at in theory uh, uh, too. But what we want to see is also a positive effect of this interaction. And here's just as a reminder from the last transparency, the loss feature. So the three body losses independent of the magnetic field detuning. And here we had uh, roughly 1.3, 10 to the 12 um, lithium atoms per cubic centimeter and interaction duration of 300 milliseconds. If we want to get to two body uh, interaction now, we have to reduce the density again. And this is what we did here. We reduced the density, also reduced the interaction duration a bit. So to get the ion survival at this point up to close to 100% again. But now we are looking at a different observable. And this I have to explain a little bit more in detail here. We want to look at the sympathetic cooling now, at the elastic collisions of two bodies. So what goes up here? Just follow me for a second. We are at the same detuning of the magnetic field and we want to do a temperature measurement again of the ion. We start at pretty hot ion temperatures, as I said. So if we do our cutoff model again, so that we cut off the high energy tail, then if the ions are hot, we get a very low ionic optical trapping probability. So the survival probability goes down being detuned from a resonance. If we take the same experimental parameters, just tuning the magnetic field on resonance where the loss features occurred, then we see that the trapping probability goes up by here a factor of two. So we see this as evidence that uh, we were capable to also increase the elastic correlation rates and the sympathetic cooling for these sets of parameters. And now, depending on one, what we want to investigate, we have, of course, tried to find the best parameters for the purpose that we are after. But this is exactly what we like to have as experimentalists, and I think also in theory, having some parameters in the experiment to control which pathway to take, not only for the reactions, but also for the interactions that you want to have in more general. Well, this is perhaps a little bit uh, too much saying controlling this already, but at least we can choose the uh, uh, the um, the import or the ratio between the interactions. Uh, what to do next? And I have to hurry up here a little bit. I just checked my watch. We see. Uh, meanwhile, we found eleven of these resonances in this uh, for this electronic state of lithium, and the uh, the very uh, uh, 
well-known theorists in this field here, Michael, Darius, Kirchek, and Agata. Uh, I all, I have the privilege to do them. And I take advantage of this privilege because I can't pronounce your, and for sure not Agata's last name correctly. So please read the names up here and see the beauty of the theory predictions here for the S-wave uh, predictions. And then here, uh, higher order resonances that might be shifted at split. This is still work in progress, but that might be capable to explain this with state of the art and further evolved uh, theory, the positions of our atom ion interactions of these loss features. Okay, and you might remind the Hamiltonian I showed you before, the spin-spin interaction, the spin-orbit interaction, playing with these additional parameters might allow to do this shifting and splitting in the right way to get this aligned with our experimental findings. A beauty to see that coming from some field where quantum information processes is in processing is in, in, in first uh, view and uh, building a quantum computer, here we can still collaborate and fight with theoreticians and discuss what might be different, what might be wrong in our setup or wrong assumptions in models, just to further evolve the insight into the systems. Okay. Now I almost have to come to the end, perhaps that's why I want to hustle you a little bit through the outlook. You can imagine what I want to emphasize once again, perhaps some just highlighted points. You can choose here between fermions and bosons losing, using lithium six fermionic, seven uh, being uh, bosonic, and rubidium 87 being bosonic, so Bose-Einstein condensates, uh, 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 degenerate Fermi gases. We can get, hopefully, with the evaporative and sympathetic cooling deeper into the S-wave regime and into complete optical confinement, again, having more time to see everything without disturbances and heating from outside. Not without, we will hit another border, of course, but getting closer to real bottlenecks. Investigating the many body interaction in these systems, that being the prediction that if you have an ion in here, that the polarization of the atoms might allow to form um, orbits of polarized atoms around these ions like snowballs and investigating these additional uh, uh, microsc mesoscopic uh, objects in the in, in, in vicinity or in interaction with these ultra cold uh, ensembles would be just a pleasure to do. Some people call it impurity in BECs. I hate the wording impurity because our iron of all of a sudden becomes an impurity. If you talk about diamonds, you talk about color centers. I would call it perhaps charge centers of beauty in this uh, context. Okay, but impurity might be better known in the community, community so far. We can further dream about doing ultra cold chemistry um, uh, within in these ensembles, and perhaps also get access to the products of the molecular products, the charged products out of this reaction, surrounding our optical trap by a box potential. So now not an RF potential that causes a lot of RF here, but an RF potential that is pretty flat, flat in the center and giving us more a box-like potential at the border. So keeping the molecular ion in here, being capable to getting it back and to do further investigation on the internal states, for example. Okay, of course, we might also be capable to load, uh, well, we did already load more ions into these ultra cold ensembles, but of course, uh, it is also a challenge to then get the right observables extracted. So we will head towards also the interaction between multiple charged particles in here and perhaps their additional surroundings that might, they might have. So heading towards testing the predictions that have been done there, not trying to verify them, but really to look in an experiment, are these things alive, mesoscopic clusters, or not? And, well, I just in a, once again, in a nutshell, sorry for hustling to you that much too, but I have to give you a short glimpse of this beauty too. Think about, uh, about two-dimensional crystals once again. If you think about the pole trap, you will have RF all over the place because you are with a lot of ions, by definition, out of the RF center. If you take now optical traps, you might get rid of this RF. And for example, you observe structural phase transitions in these crystals. Just assume you have a linear chain of, chain of ions, and now you release the radial confinement. At some point, the repulsion of the particles will be strong enough to get a zigzag structure, right? So it's just like increasing the actual confinement, releasing the radial confinement, you get a six x structure. One can observe this, one observed this in the 80s, we observed this too, so this is uh, state of the art. 
If you do this without disturbance, you might ask yourself, why does nature uh, get two ions up here and one down here? There is not only a six sex structure, there should be a sex six structure. And if nothing uh, projected, there should be a superposition of the two. And there might be ways to test whether the superposition stayed alive. But even more beautiful or even a further step could be done by getting one of these, for example, central ions into a superposition state, coherent superposition of two electronic states. Remember that the optical confinement is state dependent. That is, for the part of the amplitude where the ion is in the, for example, S state, we get a strong confinement. If it's in the D state, we get weak confinement and therefore these structural phase transitions should occur. If we are in a coherent superposition and not projecting, we should be capable to get both structural phases at the same time and the phase transition driven by quantum fluctuations, at least these are predictions by theory, and we would just like to look into this, and we should be allowed to look into this already starting with three particles, with three ions only. Not that this is for a theorist uh, sufficient because you want to have and going to infinite, of course, but for an experimentalist, it's one to two to three that gives you the way to infinity. And we want to look at this physics here. And then you could, there were proposals out there to overlap cold atomic ensembles to get uh, the sympathetic cooling for larger crystal structures and to look at perhaps dynamics of defects within these crystals that we observed uh, inside this ultra cold two dimensional structures. There's such a large ballpark to play in that it would be just a pleasure to uh, do some steps uh, along these lines. And with that, I want to thank you very much for your uh, attention and want to emphasize yeah, this would be a summary of what you should have learned but even more important is to emphasize the people who did this uh, once more and here you see an old group picture a picture i should switch to a new one and if you think this is horrible because of covid is even worse now because we can't see anyone anymore at all in real life the game players for tiamo experiment were julian schmidt now being postdoc at the nist group um alexander lambrecht um also Daniel Hönig, currently uh, as currently PhD student and the driving force together with Amir Muhammadi being the postdoc right now. The former postdoc being Leo Karpo, being now assistant at the University of Hanover. For the Bali experiment, the main players are Pascal Weckesser, just finishing his PhD, uh, Fabian Tiedemann, which we hope to get closer to finishing his PhD, master student Joachim Welz, and Tom Walker as an assistant and former PhD uh, postdoc, uh, Marco Stevatin. Okay, now asking you to accept my apologies for hustling you that much, uh, I would ask for your questions if there were any. Thank you very much. Yes, so thank you very much for this exciting talk.